budget is a moral document. Our budget, how we choose to spend, is in fact saying something about our values. It's making a statement about not the values that we articulate through slogans and easy talk around the dinner table, but the values we actually absorb and live through the mediation of government actually putting money to work. And the principal ways, if you think about what government does, it runs a military, but the principal way that, that government articulates our values is through spending. Where does the government choose to spend? On what? Is education important? Are roads and infrastructure important? Those are questions that are not simply economic questions, although the book, as it happens, talks a good deal about the economic analysis of questions like that. But there are also fundamentally moral questions. And one of the uh, uh, ideas that I, I develop in the book is to use uh, as a, uh, as a guide for all of us from chapter to chapter, sort of you know, the Virgil taking us through the inferno is um, uh, Adam Smith, whom we think of as the poster child for um, uh, uh, free, unfettered free markets, and that turns out to be completely false. He, in fact, was a professor of moral philosophy. He understood extremely well uh, that uh, markets were great, but markets are also limited. And so the book tries to develop that theme. Of course, the private sector is great in its domain, but the question is, what is its domain and what is the public domain? I'll give you a quick technical uh, example that's come up recently. Uh, if you follow the debates about student loans uh, in Washington, you discover that there are two schools of thought. One school of thought says that the government student loan programs for your kids or grandkids um, uh, is ripping them off because the government is going to make a profit after defaults, after taking defaults into account, of something on the order of $250 billion over the next 10 years. After taking you know, defa defaults, uh, no, nobody's grandchild in this room is going to default, but others do. Uh, uh, after taking defaults into account. Uh, another school of thought says uh, that's nonsense. Government is losing money, losing $150 billion over the next 10 years through losing in the sense of subsidizing students by virtue of these loans on which, under the view of the first camp, uh, the government, in fact, is making a large profit. How can those two competing uh, perspectives coexist. I mean, is one group a bunch of idiots and the other group smart? And the answer is not exactly. The answer is that they have completely different hypotheses, different perspectives, different models in their heads of what government does. And the, the model that says that um, at existing uh, interest rates where the government is borrowing at 2% and lending to um, our college kids at 7%, uh, that, uh, that the model that says that that is a money losing proposition, in effect, is saying if the government had to turn around and sell those loans to Goldman Sachs, it would have to sell those loans at a discount. From, it, would not, it would not recover uh, uh, the loans that it made. It would sell them at a loss to a Goldman Sachs or a JP Morgan or to any other marketplace participant. The trouble with that, it's perfectly true within its domain, but the trouble is that's a false metaphor. It's a false model because the reason that government lends money to, um, call it, to encourage college education is to respond to market failures. To play, to, to it turns out uh, if you're a banker, the last thing you're going to want to do is lend money to a kid to go to college, full stop. Why? Because you can't get a security interest. You can't get collateral in the form of uh, his brain or his soul. Uh, many of you may be aware of this. You can't tell a young person what to do. Uh, uh, and in short, if you're lending them money, you know, they might become uh, fantastically successful business people. They might drop out. 
Uh, they might uh, become conceptual artists. Uh, there's a wide range of outcomes over which you have no control and no collateral. So it's a dumb business to be in. But government has a completely different perspective because all of us acting collectively know that investing in education is the future of our country. And all of us collectively are a lot less concerned about whether an individual is going to end up uh, being a conceptual artist or being a software engineer and a lot more concerned in making those investments in the next generation. So the difference is not a difference um, in analytics. It's a difference in conception of what is the purpose of government itself. And those are the kind of questions that the book tries to tee up and to uh, present as much data as I can to discuss the idea that, that private markets fail in some cases, like this, uh, like the case of student loans. Uh, that government, for example, is ideally situated to provide health care insurance for technical reasons relating to how insurance markets work, uh, and so on. So um, uh, the book tries to bring an economic perspective onto what the book uh, um, explicitly acknowledges to be moral questions. What's our government good for? What are our real values? And we articulate those values, as I say, when we get past the sloganeering phase, we articulate them by our willingness to be taxed and have that money spent in particular ways. So uh, uh, I think, you know, I, I really need to do some work to depress you. So um, uh, 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 I acknowledge, of course, in general, our government uh, uh, can struggle uh, to be efficient uh, and effective. Uh, I, and therefore, one might think, why should we ever look to it? I would argue in return that we have deprecated, uh, which is the academic term, uh, we have pissed on uh, government service, is the more useful term, for um, at least 40 years now. Uh, and it should not surprise anyone that if we consistently deprecate government and government service, uh, uh, that we don't attract the best, the brightest, uh, uh, and we don't work collectively to make things better um, uh, within government. Uh, so the, the, the school of thought that we should necessarily shrink government to its bare bones begins from a, 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 a starting point in which we've done our best to sort of tear government down in, in, in its intellectual reputation. But it turns out that if we want for our kids and grandkids and great-grandkids a better world, uh, there's a lot more for government to be doing than it's doing today. It's, it turns out that uh, government investment is desirable. Uh, it throws off real economic returns, not touchy-feely returns, but for dollars invested, the kinds of returns that we should all be so lucky, the TIA craft to give us. Uh, it's necessary when you start thinking about what it means to be a country that honors the principle of equality of opportunity. That's a phrase we all agree with. Now the question is, is that a phrase we're willing to actually actualize in our lives by putting our money where our mouths is? And it's responsive to the largest socioeconomic issue of the United States today, which is inequality. Inequality actually threatens our future at every level. It threatens political stability at some point uh, of this country. Having you know, been a young person in 1968, I can remember. I'm a little disappointed in the current generation for not being in the streets, but sooner or later, uh, they will. Uh, um, and uh, it is real, and it is in, at this point, we are at risk of inequality, of economic inequality, becoming an hereditable gene of being something that people inherit, and they inherit by virtue of what money can buy, uh, not in some political sleaze sense, but in terms of the investment in human capital, the investment in ourselves represented by a very expensive educational system that we have in this country. So uh, very quickly, and I'm delighted to talk more about this if you're not sufficiently depressed. Uh, the, the OECD is sort of the trade association of rich countries around the world, uh, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. 
The United States has the highest adult poverty rate of any country in the OECD. And we have 4.3% of non-elderly households, which is the technical term for households where the uh, uh, um, senior members are under 65. 4.3% of them had kids in extreme poverty. Uh, when you apply that to a nation of 300 million or 330 million, those are a lot of individual children whose lives are being affected. And the book talks, for example, about the direct cognitive uh, consequence of malnutrition in early childhood. It just takes IQ points right off of a child and that cannot be recovered. And it talks about the very important recent studies that have demonstrated that poverty by itself makes people functionally uh, um, as if their IQs were 10 or 20 points lower because of the background noise and stress of having to live on a knife's edge every moment of your life. Those distractions, that stress makes you functionally less able to, to perform other tasks because it turns out that the human brain has limited bandwidth and a significant amount is being used up by that kind of issue. Uh, we have the highest ratio of rich to poor in the OECD. The top 10% versus the bottom 10%. Our ratio is way above that of any other country in the OECD. And I can pull up the chart if you wish later uh, to amplify on that. Uh, um, in the middle, which is the book tries to talk a lot about people in the middle, it turns out that if you look at full-time, year-round male workers in the United States, their incomes peaked in real terms, inflation-adjusted terms, about 1979. And today, they make less on real basis than they did in 1979. The only things that have made households uh, better off, and, and not at a very great rate, about half of 1% a year in growth, the only thing that has made households better off, of course, is the entry of the second to earn spouse. The typically, in most households, woman entering the workforce and the narrowing of what still remains the appalling gap between wages paid to men and wages paid to women. So the only thing that has made households better off in market terms, in money terms, has been the fact that women work. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? As everybody, some, many, many women are in the workforce because they want to be. Some are there because they have to be. Uh, and so it's very difficult to measure the question, are those households better off than they were in 1979? Uh, because all we can really measure is, do they have more money income? We can't measure the actual happiness quotient of individuals, or the welfare in that sense of individuals. So stagnant male workers' wages right at the middle, the median worker has basically not made any forward progress in his wages in the last 40 years, to me explains a lot of the undifferentiated anger that you see in politics today. Uh, the top 1%, it turns out that when you study inequality, um, uh, all the interesting things happen at the very, very, very top of the income uh, distribution in the last uh, couple of decades. The top 1% of Americans households doubled its share of the nation's total income from uh, 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 about 10 to 21 percent uh, in the course of roughly 20 years, uh, sorry, 30 years. I cut off at 2007 because the data for 2013 is not yet available and the data f between 2007 and 2013 is affected uh, dramatically by the economic collapse that this country went through. Uh, so we are unique among all developed countries in the world. We are a rich country. Um, we are the richest big economy in the world in terms of our total income, our income per capita. Uh, but we also have the highest inequality. Uh, and redistribution, a term that I don't like, um, and we'll talk about it if we have time, does less in the United States to change market outcomes than basically any other country. And the reason is because we just do so little of it. Um, so the book tries to address this um, 
uh, in, in a number of different respects. The first is to emphasize the positive returns uh, to government investment and insurance. Uh, positive in the old-fashioned you know, uh, financial sense. And I do that as a way of trying to be more inclusive. I find that if I tell people, your values stink and my values are better, um, I don't get quite as many followers as if I suggest, you know, if we invest $100 here, we'll get a 12% return. People understand the second. People tend not to enjoy the first. And so the first point in the book is to demonstrate cons consistently that, for example, investing more in infrastructure simply throws off measurable financial returns. The second is to emphasize the idea that we are systematically dishonoring a core principle of this country, which is this idea of equal opportunity and equal mobility. Um, and um, the third is to demonstrate to people an incontrovertible fact that uh, astounds many people, which is we are a low tax country, the lowest taxed country in the OECD as a percentage of our incomes. Uh, uh, um, so that we are not a high tax, high redistribution country. To the contrary, we are the lowest taxed country in the OECD as a percentage of our national income. I further uh, like to uh, uh, emphasize the point that luck has a lot to do with it. You know, I worked for Wall Street for a long time, and it always astounded me how quickly, when, when people happened to be on the preferred stock desk and preferred stocks were hot that year and they got bonuses of $8 million, how quickly people acclimated to the view that they must be the smartest people in the universe. And I think once in 30 years, somebody said to me, you know, I'm the luckiest Irishman alive. And every other case it was, I'm the smartest guy in the room, and that's why I'm so rich. And in fact, luck has a lot to do with it. And government is the logical insurer against the vicissitudes of brute luck. None of us chose our parents. You know, I didn't sign up for being smart, hyperactive, and not very attractive. I didn't check those boxes. That was the deal I just happened to get. That's true for all of us. So once you think about luck, and that's a fundamentally moral perspective without the sort of goody two-shoes implications of morality as we currently use the term. Once you start thinking about how systematically luck is relevant to our lives, you appreciate the insurance role of government. Um, uh, it turns out, uh, because I'm an academic, uh, the book must conclude that everybody before me got everything wrong, and so I do. And so in particular, I say, look, progressives on the left are wrong to fixate on high marginal, high top income tax rates as a solution. We don't need materially higher tax rates than we have today. So for those of you who are very rich, you'll be pleased to hear that. Uh, uh, what we need is more taxes, because it's going to turn out that the critical conclusion of the book is that spending money is the fundamentally progressive act. When government spends money, it cannot help but do so in, in ways that benefit the, the uh, 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 lower income families. I mean, not even George Bush um, uh, proposed the No Polo Fields Left Behind Act, right? So in every case, government spending is extremely progressive. And it turns out that that spending dominates the taxing side. So instead of fixating on high taxes, what we have to do is argue about where are there useful programs in which we can invest, where are there useful insurance programs that we don't currently offer, uh, and then how we collect those taxes. Notwithstanding that I've devoted my entire life to the question of designing tax systems, it turns out not to be important at all. So think, think how dumb I feel. Uh, and finally, the book introduces this term um, of our fiscal soul. Uh, and it, what, what that is trying to capture is this notion that, that how we actually uh, live the values that we uh, throw about is determined by how we spend money as a country, as a government. Uh, and we need to see ourselves as having a fiscal soul and asking whether it's one that we are proud of. So. Um, Government returns on public investment. Well, as I keep emphasizing, 
The business that government is in is not taxing. We love to argue about taxes, but government is not in the business of taxing for sport. Not even Democrats are. Uh, government exists to spend money. Taxing is just how government finances uh, that spending. So spending, the regnal functions is a fancy pants term for the, the, sort of the core government functions like, um, like defense. Um, uh, uh, spending is the core, uh, and taxation is just how things get financed. Government investment and insurance complement the private markets. The book is not um, uh, the work of a communist. I don't argue that, that we have to tear down private markets or heavily regulate them. I do argue that private markets fail for structural reasons. Uh, do not price things correctly. Do not reach market opportunities uh, where government can do so much more effectively. Insurance being uh, uh, an important example. Because the government investment programs, like investing in infrastructure, where our net investment today is approximately zero at the federal level. That is, the wear and tear, the depreciation on our infrastructure is as, as great as the money we are spending. We're making no progress. And if anybody's driven uh, in the last several years on any road in California, you will, you will uh, uh, see my point. Uh, Government investment has knock-on ancillary benefits as well, which is that it creates great jobs, particularly for adult men. Uh, not everyone is going to be a software engineer. Not everyone's going to you know, create the next great app. Um, uh, so uh, to have large numbers of great construction jobs was, when I was young, and when you all were young, was a way out into the middle class. So those are some of the knock-on benefits. And government insurance programs are particularly important because they respond to the technical insurance problems of what are called um, moral uh, uh, hazard um, uh, and to uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, when you offer an insurance, as an insurance company, People who buy insurance are the ones who figured out that they really need it. So there are these two problems in insurance. If you want to get insurance fairly priced, you got to get everybody into the pool, not just those who raise their hands and say, I really need insurance because I know I'm going to have a lot of uh, 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 events of whatever kind. Uh, and uh, insurance, insurers can deal with that through underwriting, through kicking people out, saying you're too risky. Uh, or you could deal with it by saying everybody's in. And that's why every other country in the world has decided to run healthcare in some fashion as a national exercise because it, it, is, it corresponds to the demands of the insurance model. Nothing else is consistent with the economics of insurance. I've, argued, I've said before, we argue all the time about tax. I'm sure that a lot of you have, have uh, uh, there may have been one-sided arguments you know, in which some of you say our taxes are too high and others of you say, no, our taxes are much too high. Uh, uh, fine, but we don't argue with the same vigor about the question of what are the opportunity costs of not pursuing useful investment or insurance programs. We need to think about government and our relation to, which means, again, our relation to each other. We need to think about that as opportunities uh, that we are confronted, net of the costs of pursuing those opportunities, net of the financing costs. Nobody likes to be taxed, but the question is, what are the opportunities that we could be pursuing that we're not? Um, and um, because there are large returns to government investment, there's this false narrative of makers and takers. That's just wrong. The economics are clear that, that well-designed government investment and insurance makes the economic pie bigger. So it's not just the zero-sum game of taking from some and giving to others uh, that it's, uh, people like to uh, um, uh, 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 imagine. Let me, in this connection, just so we understand each other, um, uh, talk for one second about uh, where all those transfer payments, transfer payments are uh, money that the government spends 
by virtue of a check with somebody's name on it. Social security is a transfer payment. So-called food stamps, which is actually called SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, et cetera, et cetera. These are all transfer programs because you can say, so-and-so got it. And the answer, this, I'm sorry to upset you all, but uh, where government money goes by way of transfer payments uh, is not to the unworthy masses. It's to you all, and almost me. Um, it goes to you all. The amount, uh, let's see if I get this to work, the amount of money, of all transfer payments that are made today, uh, about 70% go to elderly, childless households. <laughs> uh, and the amount going to households with children since 1979 has gone down from almost 20% of total transfer payments to just about 11%. So, uh, whereas, a, Transfer payments to the elderly have gone up from about 60% to nearly 70%. And the reason, of course, is health care costs, the fact that the, and the pig and the snake, the fact that we have uh, this uh, demographic irregularity uh, of the baby boom, which leads to so many uh, Americans in one age cohort relative to a normal distribution. But those are the re this is the reality of where we are. Uh, the reality is uh, that if you want to get whipped up about uh, transfer payments, uh, remember that if you look at it fairly, you're whipping yourself. Because that, that, and I'm not suggesting that Social Security should be cut. That's not the point. I have no problem in terms of policies, personally, with any of our existing programs. I think we have to recognize, though, that in a world where we're spending less and less on households with children, that maybe we need to be spending just more. Not taking from Social Security, but we need to be spending more. And I actually have data about how generous Social Security is in the book. And now I'm not going to tell you, because then you won't buy the book. But they, they, I compare us to the rest of the OECD. So if you want to know whether the US Social Security system is generous or penurious, you'll have to buy the book. Or at least one of you will, and then pass it around. <laughs> Uh, so, um, our, I, I like to think of things in Wall Street terms of, you know, investment classes and the like, I mean, you know, uh, groups of possible investment assets. In the United States today, the largest single asset class, our largest single asset class in this humming beehive of an economy is ourselves. It is human beings. Human beings today still account for 70% of GDP, give or take, and investments in greasy machinery and software, about 30%. So our lifetime incomes, it turns, and this is indisputable, that our lifetime incomes uh, and our lifetime satisfactions are directly tied to the investments that are made in each of us through education. And at the same time, because we are, in a sense, machines, as well as just sentient beings, the more we invest in ourselves, the more productive we are, the richer the country as a whole gets. If you believe in equality of opportunity, and I've never met anyone who wanted to take the other side of that, uh, maybe Donald Trump, I don't know, but if you want to believe in equality of opportunity, it must follow that you make available comparable investments in comparably able kids, regardless of the wealth of their parents. That's the only way that you can imagine a world of equality of opportunity. And for the reasons I said uh, a little while ago, talking about student loans, government necessarily must be the investor. Government must be the investor. This is the logical model. Private markets don't own people. Private markets don't have people as collateral. Private markets are not the logical investors in human capital. And uh, which is not to say that uh, one form of investment is better than another. My uh, son and daughter-in-law are heavily invested in the charter school mo movement, so I'm not allowed to say anything bad about charter schools. If that's the debate we should be having. How much should be charter schools? How much should be, that's the reasonable debate. But the idea that we care about a quality of opportunity, but then we don't put our money where our mouth is, means we don't care about a quality of opportunity. So here's a recent study, increasing spending um, um, by 
on kids from K through 12, grades K through 12, leads to seven and a half, seven and a quarter percent higher wages per year for their entire adult lives. That's a great return on your money. And yet, what we find in the real world is that school tests, uh, um, standardized tests, track median home prices in the area. Rich kids, what do you know, systematically do better on standardized tests. Uh, one of the typical reasons is that, one of the important reasons is that uh, richer kids, kids in the top fifth, that's the top quintile, uh, get seven times as much investment in enrichment programs as do kids in the lowest quintile. I mean, it turns out that if you're poor and struggling to pay the electric bill, you're probably not also paying for flute lessons for your child. Enrichment doesn't mean private school, by the way. It means flute lessons. And those of you, by the way, who want to make sure your kids, grandkids get into uh, Harvard, uh, viola da gamba or bassoon. Uh, are, are, you know, there is no way they won't get into any school they want if they are, uh, if they are uh, top flight uh, bassoonists. The academic achievement gap measures the difference between low income and high income kids and how they do. That gap has grown in recent years. That's not surprising when you look at the increasing costs of um, a college education. And it turns out that we are one of four countries in the OECD to spend more on the public education, across the country, more on the public education of rich kids than poor kids. You know, we keep company with Turkey uh, in, in that. And the reason is that most places in the country, public education is funded directly by local property taxes, which means systematically rich communities invest more in public education than poor do. That has got to be the most perverse public policy you could imagine uh, for, as a national policy. These systematic differences in investment are what I meant before when I said that we are turning inequality into an hereditable gene because mediocre rich kids, and again, the, the studies are clear, mediocre rich kids get into top colleges and earn more than do high um, uh, academic achieving poor kids. And that means that our mobility, our economic mobility, in fact, is worse than Canada, which is a closely comparable country, measurably worse, and, and, and measurably worse than much of Europe. So uh, our, uh, the mobility from um, uh, of a household over a generation from uh, poor to rich, or unfortunately it means also going sliding down, rich to poor, we're much stickier. We're much stickier at the, top, at, at the very bottom and the very top than um, uh, basically any other country in the OECD. Last couple of quick points. We are a low tax, small government country. I've mentioned this before that our tax burden is the smallest, the lowest in the OECD as a percentage of national income. Uh, and that's including all taxes. So don't give me any gruff about how California is, isn't, uh, 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 changes that analysis. That includes all uh, taxes. Um, um, the total tax system is moderately progressive, uh, but it's small. And that turns out to be more important than whether it's a progressive tax system or a flat tax system. It's a small tax system in the United States, and that means we don't have very much money to spend on things like investing in the human capital of kids. There are only two places where the United States is a spending outlier. One, of course, is military, where we spend about 42 to 45% of the entire world's spending on military. And I'm not saying that's bad, I don't know. I, mean, I mentioned at dinner that um, a great man, um, uh, Stephen Colbert, once analyzed the United States as the new Sparta, except less tolerant of homosexuality. M maybe that's who we are. That's fine. But that, if that's true, then you have to realize we've got nothing left for anything else. And if, the, if, that's the, if, in fact, we are just the new Sparta and that's all we care about, then we should acknowledge it. But I don't think it is. I think, in fact, we care about a lot more. And the other is health care where the United States does not have the best healthcare system in the world. We have some fantastic outcomes for some people, some of the time. If you choose to have a heart attack in front of a great university hospital at any point other than July and August, you will get, uh, uh, do not get sick during the summer. 
Um, uh, you know, my late grandmother would always get bored in the middle of uh, the summer when all her friends went away. She would, she would come up with an excuse and check herself into Lenox Hill Hospital for August. Uh, bad idea. Bad, let, let the interns practice on somebody else. Uh, uh, we have the most inefficient healthcare system in the world. We deliver very, uh, turns out when you work through the numbers, we have very mediocre outcomes for the country as a whole. We have great outcomes for some. We spend about 18% of our national income on health care. The next most profligate country, which depending on the year is either Netherlands or Norway, spends about 12% of their national income on health care. If we spent per capita what Norway, which is number two, you, uh, spends, we would cut spending, private and public, because in the United States a lot of spending is private as well as public, $800 billion a year. We put $800 billion a year into our pocket to spend on more productive things. Um, and um, we are 29th out of 34 countries in our total government social spending. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll skip the stuff about the growth fairy because I'm running out of time. Let me just leave with this thought that the solution here uh, you know, is not to become the next France. Uh, our budget, our, gov our federal budget, is on the order of 20% of our national income of GDP. If we increase that by about 2% of GDP, we would have a lot of money, you know, $300 billion a year to use to invest in ourselves, whether it's through uh, education, whether it's through infrastructure, whether it's through more spending on basic science. I mean, doesn't it bother anybody else that the hotbed of um, of uh, scientific uh, physics research today uh, is now in frickin' France and not the United States because Congress killed our super collider project for no particular reason. Um, uh, so it turns out that we need somewhat more spending, in my view. The book tries to develop specifically why. And it also turns out uh, that how we raise that through the tax system isn't terribly important. The left gets it wrong in its fixation on higher rates. And the reason, as I said before, is because it turns out, and the book has wonderful charts and stuff to, to demonstrate this, it turns out that spending is so progressive that the, spend, the effect of government spending drowns out the design of the tax system. If you look at what the countries you think of as having the most progressive taxes in the world, say the Scandinavian countries or Germany, what you discover is their tax systems are less progressive. They don't tax the rich disproportionately more on their last dollar of income than they do the middle class, but they're just really bigger. They're much, much bigger systems. And that, in turn, enables those countries to spend money on themselves, on their citizens, and that spending is so progressive that the outcomes make for a much more progressive and open society in which there's mobility, of uh, economic and social mobility, of a sort that we believe that we have, but that we don't, in fact. So um, um, uh, let me just leave you with this. Uh, uh, what we do questions. You can read this on your own. This, this is some advice from a dead moral philosopher. It happens to be Adam Smith. Um, um, and I, I urge you to think about the fact that we have allowed Adam Smith to become this cartoon cheerleader for uh, free market capitalism in ways that are really insulting to him, his intelligence, and to the work of you know, 2,000 years of moral philosophers before and after him. So let me stop there and answer any questions. <laughs> or not. Thank you. That's fantastic. Fantastic. I, I'm not, I, I, I don't think I have to, do I have to pay for my dinner if there are no questions? No. Yes, ma'am, there's a question right here. If you could set up the whole system the way you think it should be set up in the United States, what would it be like? The whole system being how government is organized from the get-go? or, for, well, or the, the whole, whole like, economic picture. Yeah, so again, we are a small government with a low tax, uh, low tax government where we are um, not taxing ourselves nearly enough, even for the government we have today. Uh, our deficit, um, our cash 
in versus cash out, the government is, for this coming year, going to be the lowest in 10 years. Uh, and, you know, presidents like to take a lot of credit for that. The recovery has obviously helped uh, a great deal. But that deficit's going to start widening again because of the demands, you know, unless they push all of us out onto ice flows, the demands uh, for Medicare, Social Security, other expenses are going to keep going up. And so we just we need more taxes. We need more taxes just to pay for the government we have today. Uh, and um, I don't think that that's terribly difficult to do. I make a series of very specific proposals in the book. For example, I would take all the personal itemized deductions, home mortgage, charitable, all those things, and convert them into 15% credits. So that if you're in the top tax bracket, the charitable contribution is still gives you a value from the government, but at 15% and not at 39.6%. Uh, I would uh, raise tax rates uh, on the upper middle class back to the Clinton uh, rate structure, uh, which we did not do in 2013. We raised rates only on the very top uh, marginal bracket. Uh, I would raise the gasoline excise tax, which is at this point uh, indefensibly low, uh, uh, and by itself can fund infrastructure. You know, the Congress, where can we find money to fund infrastructure? Well, if you just raise the gasoline excise tax so that it's the same in real terms as it was 25 years ago, your problem is solved. We can never do that. Our citizens wouldn't stand for it. Well, our citizens have to say, actually, that's wrong, you know? And our, we all collectively have to elect a better class of legislator. That's on us to do. The individual tax pieces are very incremental childishly easy, frankly. I could do them in a weekend. Larger question is, is the kind of government we have today uh, better, the structure, the fundamental structure uh, established by the Constitution, better or worse than the parliamentary system? And, you know, we can have an interesting debate about that, but I, I don't want to be alive for a constitutional convention that <laughs> ar uh, argues that. You referred to the elderly uh, payments in the beginning, the transfer but payments, you didn't yes. say anything about programs such as food stamps. Where does that come in there? It's in, it's in those total numbers. In other words, those are the numbers of total spending on all transfer payments, including food stamps and so on. Food stamps, by the way, are now called uh, SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Uh, so as a percentage of all payments, Transfer payments to the elderly has gone up about 10%. Transfer payments to low-income households with children has gone down by about 10%, give or take, of the total pot of transfer payments. You don't believe me, but it's true. Um, Thank you very much for your very stimulating analysis. Thank you, sir. On the uh, issue of our health care system, yes. uh, what do we need to do to make it better do we need a single payer system or what, something else? And uh, how should we start to get to th that system? Right. We don't, we have a single payer system uh, uh, in effect. Medicare is in effect a single payer system. The VA system is a single provider system, you know, where the government is not just the payer, but the government actually provides the healthcare. I don't think anybody in this country wants to go to a single provider model. You know, let's make the VA with, you know, bigger is, is probably not a winning political or policy move. But single payer of some kind, unfortunately, I know it upsets people, but is the right move. And it's the right move because it's the only one that is consistent with these fundamental problems in the insurance markets of adverse selection and moral hazard. Adverse selection being the fact that if you make insurance voluntary, uh, so anybody is, can get health insurance, thanks to Obamacare, but nobody's required to. Well, then all the young and the healthy who believe themselves to be invulnerable and to live forever don't sign up. And everybody here races you know, to sign up. And that becomes a pool of insurable risks that is un ultimately unsustainable. The only way to deliver insurance is to say to the young, you may feel invulnerable today, you will want insurance in the future. And the way that there will be insurance for you in the future is for you to start paying into the system today. And that's what single payer means. Now, 
Countries have done it in different ways. Germany, for example, uh, and I think Switzerland, have systems that look like, sort of like the United States, that is, you get insurance through a private insurer. But that insurance, they're, they're basically just administrators. The terms of the insurance that are offered, the prices that the insurance is offered, the prices, in fact, of the pharmaceuticals that they all that's set by the government. So what looks like a comparable system in Switzerland or Germany, in fact, is really is the single payer system in which you get your choice of which administrator you want for your, uh, for your health care uh, uh, payments. How should we try to get there? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Um, I believe that we have allowed ourselves, I, I worked for Congress uh, uh, for two years, um, uh, and when people ask what that was like, I say it was like being sent to prison for a crime I didn't commit. Uh, <laughs> There are 535 members of Congress. You would be hard pressed to take any random group of 535 insurance agents in the United States uh, and find that that random group had a lower you know, IQ, <laughs> cognitive functions, than the, there are a lot. And, and you know, I don't know if any of you know Wally Herger from California. Um, uh, talk slowly if you meet him. Uh, we need to elect a better class of legislator, which means that instead of being turned off by the process, no matter how frustrating and repugnant it is, we have to invest more of our personal time into the electoral, electoral process. Because otherwise, we're just left with you know, fools. Uh, uh, now, there's some very bright people, obviously, in Congress. But in any random sample of 535 people, you'd expect that to be true. What you don't have in Congress is 535 highly distinguished, intellectually pedigreed individuals, you know, uh, uh, in the French model of having gone to Sciences Po or one of the other uh, haute école, um, and who actually know a little bit about what they're talking about. <laughs> yes, sir. Two questions, if I may. One is, I've always advocated an immediate 50% cut in defense spending. You don't need five nuclear aircraft carriers to go after a bunch of terrorists hiding in caves. The other question is, I've also advocated, I'm biased obviously having worked for Caltrans, is an immediate increase of 25, per, 25 cents a gallon gasoline tax and to keep raising it until you can fix all the roads that are in bad condition. I've spent over nearly $5,000 on rebuilding yes. the front suspension of my car. Yes. I figured out that it would have been much cheaper if I was paying a higher gasoline tax yes. or other such taxes related to it. So as to the first, I am agnostic. And we should be so lucky as to have five nuclear aircraft carriers. We, we have 12, I think it is. Um, and if we got down to five, that would be a savings. And uh, there's one other nuclear-powered aircraft carrier in the world that not, not owned by the United States Navy. Uh, and if you don't know which country that is, you're just, you know, you're, you're not thinking in long-term geopolitical terms. It is, of course, France. Um, uh, because if we have one, they have to have one. Um, and it's named, oddly enough, it's named the De Gaulle. Uh, so I don't know the right answer. I understand. The argument, we should have five and not 12. I, other people say we should have 15 and not 12. I know enough to know I don't know the answer. I do know that whatever we decide, unless we literally want to be the new Sparta, and that's all we are as a country, you know, is a big military that just, you know, does its thing, we have to have more, we have to have the taxes to support it and the other things that improve the welfare of all of us. And that's where I don't see the commitment. Lots of people, big muscular military, but I don't want to pay anything. So you end up with these notions of kicking the poor, uh, get rid of those damn food stamps, tiny programs by comparison to, to, to military. And as to the gas tax, you and I are on the same page. I and mean, that's you know, absolutely clear. It's clear as a matter of economics, it, you know, in the narrow sense, because uh, there are externalities to uh, the overuse of the personal automobile. We all know that living in Southern California. There are negative consequences to all of us driving around looking for the same parking space. Uh, one of the reasons to have a higher gas tax um, is not is to collect revenue, but another is to change behavior, is to say there are alternatives 
Uh, and at the margin, you know, I'm going to get on the Caltrans uh, 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 train. You know, uh, the Expo line is going to change USC for the better uh, because we now have young professors and law students who can live at Culver City and just get on a train and be dropped off at the door of the law school. Uh, whereas uh, it radically is going to change uh, the appeal of USC, for example. Uh, so investment like that changes everything. And if it's done right, changes everything for the better. I think we're done. Thank you very much, everybody.